a brilliant poet, a brilliant thinker, and a brilliant professor. He has just received this year, 2019, one of the major literary recognitions in the United States of America, the Yale University's Nobel Prize for American Poetry for Lifetime Achievement. It is also my great pleasure to have my university hosting and honoring not only the great poet and performer that was part of our international meetings as poets three times, but one of my mentors, and I think I can say this, a friend of many years. Presently, Donald Reagan, professor of English and comparative literature at the University of Pennsylvania, Charles Bernstein was also a major figure at State University of New York, Buffalo, for some years. It was there that he met, while I was a young assistant at the University of Weimar, doing research in summer and fall at the Poetry Reverence Collection of that university. From 1989 to 2003, Charles Bernstein was David Gray Professor of Poetry and Letters at SUNY at Buffalo, where he was a distinguished professor as well as co-founder and director of the Poetics Program, an adventure that was just started at the time of my arrival. For the first time in my life, I had the chance to be a part of that community of poets, Robert Cooper and Susan Hanau were also there, and the incredible creativity was a daily experience there. As soon as we met, Charles Bernstein generously invited me to take part in his graduate seminar on 20th century poetry and poetics, which I attended every fall for almost 10 years, together with many young poets from all over the United States, but also from Europe, who came to the poetics uh, at State University of New York to have the chance to work with him. It was an amazing intellectual challenge. It made us all grow up, but it was also, especially, I should say, fun. Other than his classes and the many poetry readings and lectures he organized, I can really remember Wednesdays of four series, we were given the opportunity to hang around with professors and their guests in bars, galleries, restaurants, but also in gatherings at their homes sometimes to read together, sometimes just to discuss yesterday's class. Whilst the couple and the pioneer in his awareness of the possibilities the internet could open, Charles Bernstein still had the time to co-found the Electronic Poetry Center. And already at the University of Pennsylvania, he co-founded the Poetry Audio Archive Pennsylvania, a center for programs in contemporary writing. Both projects are wonderful contributions at the service of readers, especially students and professors of poetry and poetics. Before all this, there was already a long and diversified career. A student at Harvard College, Charles Bernstein majored in philosophy and studied the work of Austin and Wittgenstein under the supervision of Stanley Cavell, who would oversee his thesis. With Bruce Andrews, he edited the magazine Language, which ran to 13 issues 1978 and 1981. This magazine launched an avant-garde movement and for school, I know it wasn't like this, but that's what happened, that has been extremely influential in many other literary fields all over the world. Uh, very diversified in poetic opinion and voices, uh, options and voices for language authors, focus on such important and transversal issues as literary politics cultural, editorial, and language politics. Let me just quote a few words by Charles Bernstein as an example of language concerns. Politics demands complex thinking, and that poetry is an old arena for such thinking, a place to explore the constitution of meaning, of self, of groups, of nations, of value. The politics of poetry for which I speak is open-ended, the result of its interrogations are not assumed but discovered in the process and available to the formulation. Its complexity and adversity to conformity puts such a poetic practice well outside the stadium of dominant culture. It is this refusal of efficacy, call it a refusal of submission, that marks its political character." Unquote. Once I asked Charles Bernstein what was the meaning of the word language in capitalized letters and mathematical equal symbols in the meaning of the letters, 
He explained to me that the power of language, always the same in equal language, was challenged by the gap that the mathematical symbol opened to something the poet himself did not know. Poetry and science participate in the same search. As he argues, epistemology as necessarily creational and the aesthetic as epistemological. As a matter of fact, at some point, Charles Bernstein was earning a living in the field of science as a freelance medical writer, something that in an almost paradoxical way he found very important too. In an interview, he, um, he said, in New York I worked in the United Hospital Fund, then briefly the Council of Municipal Performance, and then for a couple of years as a strike editor of the Canadian edition of Modern Medicine where I wrote about 80 medical abstracts each month. This immersion in commercial writing and editing as a social space too, but more in the technical sense of learning the standardized compositional rules and forms at the most detail and non being non boring, level of proofreading and copy editing was informing in every way. He has published on such mainstream academic presses as Oxford University Press, Harvard University Press, Northwestern University Press, University of Chicago Press, and Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Among his more than 40 books, uh, I quote a few titles just to give an idea. The last one, Near Miss, poetry um, books, recalculating all the whiskey in heaven, girly man, with strings, republics of reality, 1975-1995. He is also the author of books and essays, such as Pitch of Poetry, one of his last ones, Attack on the Book of Poems, My Way, Speeches and Poems, A Poetics, A Content Stream, Essays, 1975-1985. He has edited many anthologies of poetry and poetics, including those listed in poetry and the form of world, uh, the politics of poetic form, and the language of which he standards. At the same time, Charles Bernstein was supporting small presses throughout his field of I saw him doing that at State University of New York, sponsoring many of his students' poetic projects and publishing many of their written magazines. But because he is speaking of translation, I can also tell you that he is also a translator, mainly from French, and he won in 2015, the two of his books, which were translated to German, German the Münster Prize for International Poetry. He has written the librettos for a number of operas with composers such as Benja Bolinski, Brian Fernandau and Dean Dumont. And he also collaborated in movies by Jim Yarmouch, even as an actor, and has been collaborating in many visual arts projects, namely with his wife, the artist Susan B. Elected the fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2006, other than the Goldier, his honors and awards include the Janus Pannonian's Grand Cross for Poetry the Roy Harvey Pierce Archive for New Poetry Prize, and fellowships from, fellowships from the New York Foundation of the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. In his inaugural lecture for the Center of Social Studies PhD programs, he's going to speak about double talking, the old fine sublime, comedy, appropriation, and the sounds of one hand clapping. So, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thanks so much, Thanks so much, Thanks so much, Cross, for a great introduction. Um, and uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be back in Cooper. Uh I'm going to just jump right in. I couldn't resist uh, speaking of uh, translations. Uh, my uh, translation adaption of the so at home, as some of you will know, uh, as a perfect epigraph for uh, this talk. So I call it auto psychographia. 
poets are fakers whose faking is so real they even fake the pain they truly feel. And for those of us so well read, these red pains feel oh so swell. Not the poet's double header, but the knot of the needle. And so the wheels go whack and snaring our logical part in the train wreck called the human heart. Trace. 
Homophonic translation is a form of sound tracing. My term is echopoetics. The homophonic supply is a form of delir in John Jacques a certain sense, either phony or tony, depending on how you frame it. At its core, homophonic translation refuses the Cartesian split between sound and sense, seeing sense as never more than an extension of sound. At every moment, it refutes the idea that meaning can be displaced from sound, or that reference has an arbitrary rather than motivated relationship to acoustic rhythm, sound patterning, and oral iconicity. From a pragmatic point of view, any individual poem will fall short of a homophonic sublime. In that sense, homophonic translations might be heard as pushing in a direction, collecting a course, correcting a course, re-embodying the word. The homophonic in poetry, the homophonic is poetry that leads by the ear for grounding morality, a u r a morality. Poetry that resists cutting the umbilical cords between translated and translation, source and target, original and copy, essence and accident, brain and mass, figure and ground, spirit and materiality, irony and sincerity, singer and song, imaginary and real, semantic and antic. The homophonic supply is a necessary improbable of poetry, a rebuke to rationality in the name of linguistic animation. In its archetypal form, homophonic translation creates a perfect mirror of the sound of the source poem into the target poem. It is mimesis by and as other means. While homophonic translation is related to sound poetry, the premise is that it extends the original text into a new language using real, not made-up words of the target language. In a Borgesian pluriverse, the ideal homophonic translation would be heard by the speakers of the source language as if it were the original poem while heard by the speakers of the target language as a strange word concoction, but still in their own tongue. I tried this with saying as tugged back your love, my 1993 homophonic translation of Levi Leto's Sana Kula Yola, which in a more conventional translation would be word arrived by night. Finnish speakers hear it as if it's in their own language, yet they cannot make out the words. So the Finnish, Sonnet Tulava Yola, my homophonic, is saying as Tavvag Yola, you can hear that there's almost no difference between the Finnish and my English. You're not a laughing audience, I see, but that's okay. <laughs> you are move ahead. So this video, I can't see the subtitles, but here I'm reading it, you can see the underneath the, the, the homophonic. I did a translation directly from uh, the Finnish. Homophonic translation. So made to sound exactly like Levy's original. Uh, the original title is Sana Tulava Yola. So my title is Same as Tug Back Your Love. I don't know if you can hear what I was saying in Finnish and in English because it sounds so close together. Sana tulabat yola, same as tugged fat. You are love. Oh, when Saturday tasted a muffled curtsy, talent, Yocasta's vivisected valor, silly virtual item, same as tugged fat. Your love, caput, tamed tapestries, caressed masters, tasseled blue apples. Oh, wet sanity tasted of muffled curtsy. Tower of your costas, vivisected valor, silly virtual item. Medusa pounce as vats, fails, oldest lament, jokes, tamed tapestries. Caressed masters, tacit luas. 
Oh, when Sammy tasted a muffled curtsy, talent would cost his vivisected valor. President Itsy, oily, laminated, Medusa pounced as Max Vale's oldest lament jokes. Tame tapestry caressed Master's tasseled blue eyes. Oh, when sanity tasted of muffled curtsy, Talon, your costume to the second valor. Silly virtual item, yeah, same as tub, vac, your love, kaput. There's a kind of article around this poem written decades ago for C's President Trump. In the line, President Itsy, oily, tainted, laminated. There's a kind of perverse pleasure trying to create insane homo from difference, hero. Homophonics is a pataquer, pataquer. The homophonic sublime is also the dream of a pure coach. Words for their own sake, the cry of their occasion. Conci, only this and nothing more. A pure homophonic or isophonic or synphonic translation would be the same words brought into a new language, not at all uncommon for proper names and place names. The Mexican conceptualist Ulysses Carrion plays on this possibility with his the translation of Pedro Parano, a reference to the 1955 novel by Juan Rulfo. Pedro Parano. 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 So as you'll see further, these are audio sound realizations of what is just alphabetic text in, um, in the Ulysses Carrion uh, work. Homophonic translation is parasitic. A parasite that may want to live symbiotically with its source or may wish to replace it, at least in becoming a new poem in its own right, autonomous, no longer dependent on the original, but an original of its own. In the use of poetry, Basil Bunting writes about reading Persian, German, Italian, and Welsh poetry to a class that did not know these languages. He generally insists that the students would get as much out of hearing a foreign language poem as hearing one in their own language, since pronouncing a word is more important than knowing its meaning. While Bunting's recitation of foreign language poems, incomprehensible to his students, was quite a serious endeavor, I see the connection with post-war American comedian Sid Caesar's double talking, deliriously funny verbal improvisations that sound like Italian, German, and Japanese speech, but are composed on the tongue with made-up strings of words. Where Caesar gets laughs, Bunting gets Poetry. Bunting's insistence on sound over meaning is an extension of his framing of poetry in terms of music. Perhaps the most common experience related to Bunting's modest proposal is listening to an opera sung in a language you do not know and feeling you are missing nothing, indeed preferring to hear the original to hearing the libretto sung in translation in your own language, and moreover preferring to listen without subtitles. It's no coincidence that opera parody is crucial to Sid Caesar's double talk. The Zaoumi poems of Russian futurist Velvet Kletnikov and Alexei Krushenev were composed of synthesizing or inventing words that, whether intended or not, broke down the barriers of nationalist tongues and evoked species-wide listening, something that might be compared to Esperanto, despite the radical differences. 
Incantation by Laughter is the best known Zalun poem. My transcreation follows the sound. Robert Grenier took this almost literally. 
writing a series of poems in 1975, sentences toward birds that transcribed into the American the actual sounds of birds in his immediate environment. Here are three of the poems which, like his later sentences, are printed each on individual cards. So these are the three. See if you can hear why they sound like birds. And this should be, even for those of you who don't know English in the way that Grenier does, it should sound like there are sounds in Portuguese as well. When you say you see, later. When you say you see, later. Didn't see go to a. Didn't see go to a. A bird who would call. Not for, but for you in the day. A bird who would call, not for you, but for you in the day. More recently, had Tulicki's air fog less not hay on, uh, forgive my poor uh, pronunciation, a uh, Gaelic pronunciation, away with the birds, has explored the releases of bird sounds in Gaelic poetry and song. In his book, Ah to Zut, The World of Birds, The Word of Birds, John Devins not only provides a lexicon of bird songs, Chinka 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 is the homophonic signature of the swamp sparrow, but also a set of mnemonics, such as the sparrow's lyric refrain, maids, 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 put on your tea, cattle, 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 which makes the verse into song as if this is a Broadway musical. So that is the equivalent of maze, 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 put on your tea, cattle, cattle, cattle. Maze, 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 put on your tea, cattle, 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 no time to waste, get out your base, fiddle, 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 young lads make haste. Dance to your love's riddle, riddle, riddle. Bevins also suggests a motto for the homophonic sublime in his adoption of Walter Pater on music. All art aspires to the condition of bird songs. Sparky. Perhaps the ultimate revenge of the long tradition of homophonics belongs to Sparky Williams, the talking budgie, a bird who in the middle of the 1950s was able to carry a wide range of English words mimicking human speech. Human language echoes longing against the formative sound of the 
beasts. Wittgenstein takes the remark in the Greek the German there, a homosyntactical word for word translation would be if a lion, if a lion speak could, we could him not understand. But when the lion roars in a duet with McClure's mimicking, we hear the sound as song, a wail, perhaps a lament. The lion is growling at the human intruder's appropriation, as if to say, I am the king of my own language. Do not mock me. And the growling at us, the unseen listeners, seems to say, beware. Listening to a poem or opera or language foreign to you, but feeling you get it all the same, is a far cry from homophonic translation. It leaves the original just as is, the foreignizing occurring in the listener's response. If the aim of a poem is to foreground the materiality of sound, then listening to a language you don't know is a kind of poetic experience. But that only goes so far. Listening to a poem in a language you don't know gets less interesting the longer it goes on. Entropy sets in faster than a mosquito dodging a fly swatter. Since Caesar's double talk, his mimicking foreign language sounds, is hilarious because it exaggerates it exa because it is exaggerated in its stereotyping and because you know he is going on nerves. It is a high wire act and wire is not that long. In contrast, homophonic translation allows for extensions and textual subtlety since it goes beyond imitation into commentary and because it is able to create a new poem in the new language. And I'll get to a clip of Sid Caesar's double talking in a moment. Let me make a brief detour in my account to consider Edgar Allan Poe's The Philosophy of Literary Composition, published in 1846, near the end of the troubled poet's life. Poe's delightfully bizarre pain to artifice is in part a send-up of spontaneously inspired, frenzied, sincere verse what Poe calls ecstatic intuition. Writing about the raven, Poe claims that the origin of the poem is a set of logically predetermined effects, including sound effects. Meaning comes after. In effect, Poe attempts to treat verbal composition as if it were musical composition. Poe's elaborate and impossible rules for poetic composition bring to mind Sid Caesar's grifter-like elaboration of impossible rules for a card game in his early 1950s sketch the poker game. Both Poe and Caesar offer a kind of double talk or talking out of both sides of the mouth, though in these cases not deceptively, since their discourse foregrounds the absurdity, even though performed with straight faces. In the comic pathos of Poe's insistence on the author's total control of the poem through the rigidly predetermined, Poe never breaks character, that of the author whose sole aim is beauty achieved by maximizing melancholy, not to say pathos. Poe elaborates his double talk with absolute conviction. Like Sid Caesar, Poe aimed to please the popular and critical taste. Both Baudelaire and Mallarmé's translation of The Raven in 1865 and 75, respectively, swerved toward the home front, often echoing Poe's exact sound patterns. Even if you don't know French, you'd recognize The Raven if the translation were performed. Wenn ein Trieber gesessen und ein Mieter sich vergessen, die Bergalter von der Hand von der Hand fallen in der Leer. So that's a Yiddish version of the Raven, which you could, if you remember the Raven, once upon a midnight jury, you could hear that consistent pattern in any of the language, uh, any of the languages that are translated into, including the Baudelaire and the Mallarmé. The Raven is as identifiable as Beethoven Smith. And if you don't know Yiddish, it can seem as if it's double talk, made up language. The modern history of radical translation in American poetry might reasonably begin with Pound's Chinese adaptions, but I want now to briefly cite the two translations of Guido Cavalcante's Donnie Prayer, this is uh, from the late 1200s. The first from 1928, the second from 1934. Pound gives the constraints worthy of Poe's philosophy of composition, 
or seats with poker games. Each strophe is articulated by 14 parallel and 12 inner rhyme sounds, which means that 52 of every 154 syllables are bound into the pattern. So uh, I won't read the pattern, but the, there it is. Very interesting, uh, two versions that it does. In 1940, at the beginning of World War II, Louis Zukoski took the Cavalcante translation through another dimension. What he produced was not a homophonic translation, but rather a sound transcreation that radically accented the poem, making it in part an ethnic dialect poem, a sort of Yiddish double talking, where double talking implies bilingualism and double consciousness. As with his inaugural poem beginning thus, Zukoski radically engaged an American, American vernacular following the model of Pound and Blues, and he brought it home to a Mongolian mother tongue, homey and homely but with the majestic beauty brought over from the sound structure of the Kavakanti. So the opening uh, lines in Zukovsky's translation, a foreign last bothers me, I gotta tell her, of the fact so unruly, often earth it comes, can't soften its proud next call of me. And Zukovsky keeps all of those rhythmic patterns and rhymes that the pound articulates. Perhaps the closest recent work of this kind Translation into marked comic dialogue with accent or alas is the riotous, the communist manifesto of what we workers want, redacted and introduced into dialect with West Riding near Yorkshire, the Steve McCaffrey, a son of that child in 1977. So McCaffrey's translation or transcreation of Kant's manifesto into his own. Uh, uh, Regional local dialect where he's from. Okay, now to Sid Caesar. Discussion of homophonic translation generally place in the context of radical poetic innovation. I want to contrast that lineage with two examples from American popular culture. One from the post-war comedian Sid Caesar, the most popular and influential TV entertainer of the late 1940s and the early 1950s, and the other from Benny Lava, a recent viral YouTube video. Double talk, as Caesar uses the term, is a homophonic translation of a foreign language movie, opera scenario, everyday speech into an improvised performance that mimics the sound of its first language with made up, zaboo like, invented language. Consider the uproarious, uh, 2000, consider an uproarious 2015 performance by French poet Joseph Guglielmi, where he performs a made up language under the disguise of reading a poet a text, which at one point at the guise of reading a poetry text, which at one point you can see in the video is entirely made of blank pages. In contrast, literary homophonic translation begins with a defined foreign language poem as a source text and creates a new work in English that mimics the sound of the original. The best example of Caesar's double talk is a concert in which he moves through four languages, starting with French and moving to German and Italian and ending with Japanese replete with recognizable uh, anchor words, such as Mitsubishi, Datsun, Sushi, you can hear those words flipping through. I don't urge any of you to do this particular routine and to leave the auditorium, but the, the longer version uh, of, of, of this section, I, I, I feel, uh, with World War II more, uh, you know, Charlie Chaplin's name is um, uh, the great dictator is a long double talk by the, the, the hip double. And there were a number of cartoons, the music cartoons, which used German double talk. So the German and the Japanese, obviously, early really into the Second World War, but since these were coming out of that. Um, discussion of homophonic translation um, that I want to switch to and pivot to in this part has to do with the wild popularity of Sissi. Everything else I mentioned is wildly obscure with the exception of the Pope. And here, this, this was the most popular entertainer in America at the, in, the, in the late 40s and 50s. Since Caesar's trouble talk is mimicking foreign language sounds, it's hilarious because it's exaggerated and it's stereotyping, and because you know he's going on nerve. It's a high wire act. It's a high wire act, and the wire is not that long. In contrast, more fun translation allows for extensions and textual subtlety since it goes beyond imitation into commentary and because it's able to create a new poem in the new language. Taken as a whole, 
This five-minute performance is Magarai, a burlesque jungle of, or a burlesque jungle or comic hodgepodge of different languages. The camera pans to the audience during each segment to show benign and approving laughter. The serial movement from language to language also suggests a nomadic display of multilingual code switching. It brings home the final line of Charles Reznikoff's 1934 poem about diaspora. And God looked and saw the Hebrews, citizens of the great cities, talking Hebrew in every language under the sun. Though perhaps this might be revised to say Yiddish rather than Hebrew. So since Caesar is a, a Jewish American, uh, second generation, first generation born in America, they would fly with lip, they would tell them Yiddish, uh, which I go into in the longer version. Yiddish is a nomadic language not based in any nation, but creating a common tongue for diaspora Jews in Poland, Hungary, Russia, and America, among other places, including Reznikoff and Zakowski's parents. While sometimes thought to be a dialect of German, Yiddish is its own language, spoken by people who did not know German. As a consequence of the systematic extermination of European Jews, compounded by Israel's turn against Yiddish by second Hebrew as its national language, Yiddish came to be a dead language like Latin, though it persists with vitality in pockets. While all Caesar's double talking is done with good humor, his signature German double talk is also, in effect, proto-Nazi double talk, and is laced with gentle but devastating mocking. The prime example is one of Caesar's best known double talk skits, which you can the German general from 1954, written with Mel Brooks. Caesar's double talk uses the full prosodic resources of verbal language for rounding intonation, gesture, rhythm, syntax, and sound pattern rather than lexical identification. Double talk resembles sound poetry, but it is tied to the specific sound and rhythms of the language being parodied. It is homophonic translation, not a specific text, but rather of the texture of the source language. Like double talk, homophonic translation, zaoumi, sound poetry, and scat singing are not against expression, they are hyper-communicative. Sound writing makes meaning by other means, other that is than the meaning for those who feel at home in the world, who want to make the world more homely, gemutly, hamish. At home, according to theologian Ernest Fuchs, one does not speak so that people will understand, but because people understand. Language at home is marked by the temporal, transient, always in process, the presence of a God Here, language is emotional in its understanding of time ranges between song and shout. The presence of the word, that is, verbing the word, is antinomian. Antinomian meaning um, outside the law, against the law. The performance of language supersedes the law of language. Only that which can become present as language is real. Fuchs writes, for where meaning is, there also is language, and where language is, there is reality. Language belongs so closely to reality that it sets reality free for the first time. Language expresses reality. The word not merely conveys the concrete situation, but creates it. In 1912, Franz Kafka gave an introductory lecture on jargon, a talk on Yiddish that he wrote as a prologue to a performance of Yiddish poetry. Yiddish represented for Kafka a kind of immediacy of expression in hard contrast to the endemic alienation of Western assimilated Jews like himself. Yiddish for Kafka is related to Fuchs's idea of language at home. At the same time, Kafka saw Yiddish as midbata, Great stigmatized dialect, a language appropriated from other languages and a subcultural art, a minor language, as the Luz and Guitar have in Kafka for the minor literature. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, a discussion of this, this essay by Kafka, which I'll be cut off there. Don't talk so kind of talk poem to use David Ann's term. As with jazz, the performance is live and improvised. Both of these elements are essential. Caesar's double talk, while markedly American, is accessible to those who don't know English, and in that sense, it works like sound poetry, a scarcity. 
verbal words that do not require knowledge of a specific national language. Call it transnational to give it a different spin. During and in the immediate wake of the systematic extermination of the European Jews, Caesar's double talk broke down the barrier of national languages by creating a sense of the delightful camaraderie of difference and by diffusing ethnic tension. Difference is alive the immediate accessibility. The groucho Marxian comedy of puns and verbal wit made it difficult for non-native speakers to fully understand. Not so double talk. Double talk is a verbal pantomime as paradoxical as that sounds, or doesn't sound. It is words sublimed to music. In contrast, the American homophonic poem may have aspired to be non-English bound, but its reliance on puns and allusions may sometimes run counter to this. Caesar's homophonic is all about accent, and accent is always a matter of class and ethnicity. In American culture, to have a marked accent is a stigma, a mark of your status as immigrant or ignorant. During Caesar's reign, people went to classes to lose their accent, or more accurate to say, learn the right accent. At the same time, in the years before World War II, ethnic comedians had their audiences rolled in the aisles by performing in their own and their audience's accents. This was the world of comedy Caesar came into. But it's one thing to make good fun with your own accent, another to mock the accents of others, which was also a state of American ethnic comedy which too often took an explicitly racist turn. Even if black-faced performers identified with African-Americans, it did not undercut the racism of the appropriation. Mimicry always risks being heard as ridicule or mockery. Double talk is usually considered something bad, deceitful, fraudulent, saying one thing and meaning another, a means of disguising the true meaning of something. It is connected with viral Jewish stereotypes, all repeatedly invoked in Pound's 1941 to 1943 Radio Rome speeches, the uprooted usurpers of a language not rightly one's own, destroyers of the plain sense of the word and authenticity, untrustworthy, diabolical, clever, all quotes from the Pound's speeches. Don't talk is associated with gobbledygook, obfuscation, gibberish, fake or counterfeit language, what Orwell famously stigmatized as double speak or bullshit, which gives an appearance of solidity. To pure wind. It's interesting to hear Trump's appropriation of bullshit in response to the impeachment hearings. If the talk of carnival barkers, crooked politicians, and kite lawyers, fascists, and con it is the it is the talk of carnival barkers, crooked politicians, and kite lawyers, fascists, and communists. It is nothing but bad faith. Double talk begins in deliberately unintelligible and fragmented modern poetry. Modern poetry has often been tarred with this brush. It's fast talking on theory and chock full of allusions, allusions and evasions, obscure references, logic collapses, emotional bankruptcy. In other words, the kind of poetry I want. Caesar saw the poetry in these language textures, even if he would have figured them as material, not poetry. In the immediate wake of the extermination of the European Jews, he practiced a kind of shtick alchemy, turning the Jewish stigmas of accent and shyster into song, in the process of turning the tools of intolerance and nationalism on their heads. Double talk is applied nomadics, to use Pierre Doris's term for non-national language. It is pushing back against blood and soil nativism. The inaugural work of American homophonic translations, William Cecilia Zukoski, Hollis, discussed in the part of this essay I'm not presenting now. But Sukhasi also worked with home finance and striking passages with Wong Wong A15 was written in 1964, with the second, stand, the second stanza that begins with a home finance translation from the Book of Job. Without critical exegesis, it would be unlikely most readers would get the source as the Book of Job, just as most of Caesar's viewers would probably not recognize the last laugh as having the <coughs> The movie of Last Life as the source for uh, Caesar's The German General. Both Sukowski and Caesar insisted that their works could stand on their own, yet knowing the source adds an uncanny dimension and marks the works as echo poems, low, low, and co. So that's one of Sukowski's uh, echo of Hebrew, if you don't know, keep Hebrew prayer, correct to God, so it sounds a little bit like Hebrew.
like Caesar's double talk, the weaving the amorous, the constant homophonics is not pure, but part of its texture. It's midrashic and antinomian, often echoes of the sound of the Hebrew, but also the biting commentary on Joseph Gall in his whining name about the cruel hire that life has turned out to be. So one of the arguments I'm making in this section is that the homophonic isn't just a sound play, it's especially it's a constant, it's a great little commentary about the content of the homophonic itself and about the Hebrew in the homophonic translation. The third standard eight of A15 begins with an echo of God's answer to Job from out of the world. Zukaski hears wind and his war in the Hebrew, wind and his war. God answers in the, in the King James Version, who is this that darkens his counsel by words without knowledge? Zukaski hears milling leaks doubt, milling leaks doubt. That qualified translation, like typing without writing, just scratches the surface. Words without knowledge, blowing in the wind, transit, a cruel fire. Man up, says the big man to despair of Job. And maybe Job knew what he was talking about. His words, even if they grind out, speak to diasporic peoples with more resonance than God's. Milling it into what? Poetry? Who is this? The Torah's God asks. Who talks without accepting the basis of knowledge must be grounded in God's nativeness in the one who laid the foundations of the earth? Who is this who got the goal, Zukovsky's word, to talk out of the top of the head and from all sides of the mouth? Let there be double talkers who scribble and yammer in the wind, reported in water. The most uh, striking word of American Homophonic translation after Zukovsky's Catullus comes from another Jewish poet, a close reader of Zukovsky, David Melman, born in 1938. Melman's 1971 code is a single work of close sound sound writer. But it's Melman's 1983 Men in Aida that is the breakthrough for homophonic translation. Men in Aida is a full scale homophonic translation of the first two books of the Iliad, replete with echoes of contemporary San Francisco gay culture at the time of the AIDS catastrophe. Homo means home. Here's the opening passage of Homer's Greek. First, then transliteration, then Melnick and Bowl, and finally the standard heterophonic translation. Melnick's is a strict rather than loose homophonic translation. So the first line of the men in Aida, they appeal a, a day, O Achilles. Transformed into narrative in Chinese. 
Quotidian English is transformed into lyrically fanciful Chinese. The stock phrase, or close your eyes, is homophonically rendered as Chinese. The Chinese isophone, in turn, is translated into English as jade do appears as morning memories. English becomes English, which translates as chanted beautiful poetry. Not bilingual, but inland, as in the final section of crop, 
rolling with the permutations of an English phrase in Norwegian. So many people have to go there and they go to the city in a way so how they are not in the car's name. For them, they are not in the car's name. So they have a chance to feel the body as they are with words taken take away so all the open and those who see them for them they are so they are not in the car's name. So they have
Polemical structures that propose an intense, deliberate reappraisal of the given world and its given forms on the world of Burkhoff. Zukowski and Melnick are not likely to defend classical Greeks or Latins or Romanians, as Caesar puts it in the 1964 sketch. But this is perhaps what separates unpopular poetry with mass market comedy and commercial entertainment. The dialectical power relationship in translation, who's on top or what's dominant, source or target, cannot be abolished by poetic fiat. The promise of a homophonic sublime is always imaginary, or perhaps to say, a fantasy of the imaginary. Thanks very much.